Uh, I'm honored to be interviewing Professor Peter Mitchell from Melbourne, Australia. He's currently the head of the inter neurointerventional department at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the head of statewide endovascular file retrieval services and the head of pediatric neurointervention. He's involved in some of the most influential trials which shaped our current practices, including Extend IA, Extend IA TNK, Dawn trial, just to name a few, and also presented uh, the results of the latest direct safe trial this morning um, at our conference. Um, so congratulations, first of all, on uh, completing this trial and uh, you made it clear that we can't really generalize our interventions to an entire population, but need to heavily consider subpopulations. And that would seem to be, you know, echoed in chance two as well and many other studies. Um, so all this is true. Uh, how do you, how do you feel about the results of the, of the trial? And many people believe we'll be giving, uh, thrombolysis forever. Yeah, that's, uh, um, it's a, a really good question. It's, I, I think, much like the Hermes collaboration has um, taken the multiple individual trials uh, and allowed individual patient level meta analysis, that I think is where uh, we will see the field going. And um, we're very proud of our trial and very proud to have um, pulled off a, a, a multinational trial. It's it's no small feat and I really acknowledge our investigators and the patients who participate and the hospitals that participated across Australia, New Zealand, China and Vietnam. Um, the trial did not show non-inferiority uh, of a direct strategy, um, which is what you're alluding to as to whether this um, indicates intravenous thrombolysis forever. But already we're seeing in the preliminary meta-analyses combining the uh, published trials of direct thrombectomy to date, mm -hmm. um, that um, with increasing numbers and narrowing confidence limits, we can see that um, for a 10% um, non inferiority margin, um, the meta analysis that was presented um, by Killian uh, in uh, at ESOC uh, showed that non inferiority was shown uh, looking at that meta analysis. Yeah. We're presenting tonight uh, an updated meta analysis, including the direct safe data. Um, but just looking at what was presented at ESOC. Um, we're getting further along saying there's not much difference and depending on where you're happy to accept a non-inferiority margin, it would seem that um, there is a little difference between um, direct thrombectomy and bridging therapy. Um, if patients turn up to your site and are eligible for intravenous thrombolysis and have no relative contraindications. I, th I think it's a lay down misery. If it's not going to slow things down, then they get intravenous thrombolysis. Um, if you're in a healthcare system where adding the intravenous thrombolysis to the mechanical thrombectomy is an unacceptable cost burden, uh, yeah. I think people will be making a decision just to go direct to thrombectomy. If you turn up and you're on the margins and you, you will have seen this yourself, you know, uh, it's not often you get a straightforward four hours since last known well, 50 year old with aspects of nine and an M1 occlusion. That, that's an easy decision that any of us can make. More often than not, we're confronted with the 85 year old who's an MRS two, but maybe three, who's got some moderate early change. They're a wake up stroke. Um, the perfusion is a bit marginal. Um, then you get some more information. They're actually not that, they're really more of a three than a two. Um, and they've got some high risks of hemorrhage and they're on um, digibitrine. 
all of a sudden, I think the extra information we're getting out of these trials is that you're not sacrificing very much by giving up thrombolysis in those patients. And I think that's how we'll use it. Um, we're not likely to, to jump across to direct for everybody, but for any of the patients that are on the margin, um, I think we'll use the additional information available to proceed direct to thrombectomy. Long answer, that, sorry. No, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, throw your mother-in-law into the mix and it's a whole different answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's always a provocative approach, the mother-mother-in-law um, yeah. scenarios. I like it. So um, the next question ties in with, you know, we've been playing with thrombolysis and uh, the, uh, and all these trials have, in endovascular and thrombolysis have shown that the main point is we need to shorten the time from onset to reperfusion. Um, and we've been attempting to do that with improving workflow, mobile stroke units soon in Australia, stroke helicopters. And um, even recently I read the, about a concept that endovascular teams with, with a helicopter actually travel out to perform procedures to shorten that, to shorten that time. Um, do you think that mobile endovascular suites will ever happen? How do you see the future playing out? Actually, I look, I, I do like that, um, you know, you've got drip and ship um, as a paradigm, but then um, uh, Jay Mocco and, uh, and yep. his team in New York um, had um, the, you know, stick the interventionist on the tube and send them out to the hospital and that's how they were providing services across multiple sites and i think that's uh, i think that really highlights you, you do what works in your environment in a dense city like new york where you've got very big population high population density difficult difficulty moving patients from a to b that was a really strategic smart approach saying, well, actually, if we've got the infrastructure at both hospitals, but we're a bit short on interventionists, why don't we deploy our interventionists? It's a lot easier to send somebody uh, than bring the patient. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, the, the, the MSU, we've, we've had the Australian first um, uh, mobile stroke unit at Melbourne under Steve Davis and Jeff Donnan, and that's been functioning mm. for a couple of years now. And that certainly gets some patients in that golden hour where they get their intravenous thrombolysis. They can be triaged direct uh, to a thrombectomy capable centre if necessary, and, and that's that's a great approach. Um, I'm probably not enough of a visionary to imagine how you could have a mobile endovascular stroke suite, and I actually think you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck out of uh, telerobotic work and that's um hell rice has already started um looking at that in the gold coast we're looking at it as well but haven't implemented anything um i've seen vitor's presentation um a year ago now on how that was starting and to me you know they've gone from being able to comfortably do something at a workstation with the patient in the next room um to increasingly starting to do um, to another hospital potentially um, and maybe just assisting more like proctoring a case if you like but yeah. um, I, I think we'll get to the point where you can have um, a neurointerventionist who's capable of doing thrombectomy with a high experience assisting either a junior faculty or maybe non-neurointerventionists depending on your healthcare system um, and, and making that work, and that—that's, I think that's really exciting. Uh, I think it'd be a great, a, a great solution to providing a twenty-four-seven work cover, especially in places where you, your caseload's always going to be so low. In, in Mildura, for us in Victoria, that's five hours by road. It's it's stretching the limit of our helicopter transport. The new helicopters can make it, but others couldn't. It's a long way away. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and yet the population density is such they're only ever going to have a handful of cases a year that are suitable for thrombectomy. You can't have a whole team up there, but, yeah. but having they do have people who can puncture groins and do angiograms, and if you can assist them remotely, 
uh, I think that's got a lot to offer. It's a great, it's a great idea. So, in in um, in addition to you know decreasing the time to reperfusion, um, we have a lot of large core uh, trials coming up. You know, increasing you know the the indications for our intervention. Possibly, uh, I've seen some patients enrolled in Tesla Select Two who I feel have actually done surprisingly uh, well, or maybe that's my bias because we remember the good ones. Uh, what do you, how do you feel about uh, the cases you've seen? Yeah, likewise. In fact, the, the case that I showed um, in the debate um, has done, yes, surprisingly well. Um, the, the debate format was a bit of fun, um, debating yeah. large core and, and is the sky the limit? And, and we all go into it for a bit of fun and, and, and it's an opportunity to, you're given a side to take. So it's not, you're not arguing a side that's your necessarily your passion and you therefore create an argument and in doing so, it also makes you look at your own biases and the alternative because you're trying to think what people will say back to you. Um, I've, um, I, I again get back to this individual medicine. While I believe in trials and while I believe for a system and a hospital, um, you, you pay for what's been proven to work, um, I have no doubt, uh, as was said in the debate last night, that the margins are not set rigidly at 50 or 70 or 100 mils. Um, so I, I, we don't try to apply a rigid cutoff of 70 mils because we know that selects patients will do excellently, but it's cutting out people who do very well. I think there is a long way to push the margins. I think, um, you know, getting up, when I look at what's a large core, I'm really looking at the case, and you've seen them, where you look at the non-contrast CT and and you think, I don't know, is it is it aspects two or three or four? That sort of case, especially if you've got perfusion imaging that says this is 150 mil core, if there's no mismatch, I don't think that person has much hope for any significant gain. Um, but you can also see that same patient with the abysmal looking non-contrast CT, but we do a perfusion study and we see, as in the patient shown, that there's a whole strip up along ACA, MCA territory that uh, looks as though it's um, threatened tissue, um, but isn't infarcted, and that can be saved. And in a 30 or 40 year old, um, they may make a reasonable rehab with that. So, like you, I've um, I, I try to keep an open mind to the large core. I, I don't think there should be an absolute cutoff, uh, but I really think those heat map graphs that I showed from the Hermes analysis. Um, put it really nicely. If you know the patient you're accepting is coming from two hours away and they've already got a big core and they have very little penumbra and they have compromised premorbid function and they're 85 or 90, yeah. um, you can put the package together. It's never one single thing, but if you put the package together and you've got all of those above features, that's not somebody we should be transferring for treatment. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, agreed, agreed. So in, on, the, on the other front, um, we um, have developing our endovascular devices. Uh, we've come a long way. New catheters coming out every year. Um, do you think uh, we are plateauing in, in their function or do you think there's going to be uh, a lot more innovation? Uh, Dr. Dunnan mentioned this morning that maybe we'll be using uh, magnets in the future instead of catheters and groin puncture. So what do you think? Yeah, look, uh, uh, I, I suppose baby steps. Um, yeah. uh, I, 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 um, I'm a we adapt, we use adapt in some cases, but I'm still a uh, I, I want to try and get the best possible result in the shortest possible time, um, 
and for me that's combining stent retrievers and distal aspiration catheters. Um, if I had a balloon guide catheter that would work easily with those that approach, that'd be good. I used to use a balloon guide catheter all the time. I, I, we rarely do now. So for me, yes, ad ADAPT works, but ADAPT with a stent retriever in my hand works even better. So the next steps for that would be the increasing um, inner diameter of the distal aspiration catheters. Now, you're right, I, I suspect we've hit, we, we must be hitting a plateau in that because the catheters we've got available to us now are very trackable. Yeah. They've got very large inner diameters. And when the inner diameter of the catheter you're using is approaching the diameter of the vessel you're trying to retrieve the clot from, there's really no further you can go with that. So I, I think we are reaching a plateau. And I think that's also mirrored by the fact that um, yeah, even in our trial, um, you know, we're retrieving 90% um, TIKI 2B3. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and, and I think, yes, we can we can aim at 90% 2C3, but I think we're getting there. The only other thing I'd mention for access, I think um, I take my hats off, hat off to the people who go for the radial approach. We use it selectively. Um, and I think because we like large bore catheters, there'll be a lot of patients who you can't do that on because there's a lot of patients who can't take um, a six French guiding yep. catheter up the radial artery. But there are certainly some great advantages to doing radial when you can. Um, so I think radial's probably better. Direct stick, uh, I don't know, unless there's some amazing innovation, we, we do it occasionally. Uh, I'm I'm anxious every single time I do it about, you know, how I'm going to close, am I going to use a closure device, you know, if yeah. I had to give them 2B3A, etc. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exciting. Um, and I'm hope, I hope there is more to come or that we perfect our technique even more. Um, but do you ever think that we'll go beyond the vessel wall, be able to perform biopsies, uh, yeah. uh, tumors and such, yeah. you know, and safely close off the vessel? Come back. Wow. That's, um, oh, look, I, I like the minimally invasive um, uh, new surgical hematoma evacuate trials that are being done. There's kind of almost yeah, endoscopic. Yeah, that's that's exciting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, that's that's. Uh, um, have you got any ideas about that, or you've talked about that before? I've I've just thought about it myself. That I thought when I um, thought about going into endovascular many years ago, and um, actually it happened while I was rotating in neurosurgery, and I thought taking that damn skull off every time is looks like such a pain maybe we can come from the inside and i've just been thinking about ways that it can be done i haven't seen it yet um, i know that there's some stents you can put in the venous system to drain csf you know uh, and things like that but uh, it seems like it would greatly ex expand our indications and be an exciting direction to explore yeah i look i i I like the way you think. Um, I think the, yeah, I, I, I think that'll be the next generation of people coming at doing uh, biopsies um, via a trans arterial route. I've certainly had um, in my time at uh, OHSU in Portland, Oregon, um, I worked with uh, Ed Newalt, uh, who initiated uh, blood brain barrier disruption with um, trans arterial. Uh, use of uh, high volume, high dose mannitol to disrupt the blood brain barrier oh. and then to directly infuse chemotherapy agents trans arterially, which would then penetrate the brain um, and have a better effect than if they were given systemically, yeah, uh, yeah. which was very novel. That's back in, uh, back in 1992, 93. So a long time ago now. 
Uh, the fact that it hasn't become widespread means that there are many challenges to its implementation. But you can't help but think um, uh, in another life I did peripheral intervention as well. Now the the surtex surspheres work that's done delivering yttrium itri 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 to uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh -huh. Now uh, we know there are hypervascular tumours um, and you know, that sort of approach, figuring out whether you can deliver some of these um, targeted uh, chemo radiation uh, via a trans arterial approach. I think that's got some some attraction as the catheters have advanced, but also the agents we have available aren't just chemotherapy drugs anymore. There's a whole range of things. So some of those uh, may well turn out to be options. Yeah, yeah, good, good thoughts. Yeah. Um, well, I know that you have been involved in the future at least a little bit, probably more than a little bit with uh, Dr. Oaksley. I, one of the most exciting oh, yeah. projects that you are involved in is the uh, Stentro by Synchron, right? Where you're implanting uh, a stent in the venous sinus and it's reading brain waves, uh, so-called a brain computer interface. Um, how soon do you think that's going to be widespread considering it's already in some humans? Yeah, look, I've, uh, yeah, with, with Tom Oxley, um, started the, uh, the concept of the animal lab work at the University of Melbourne, which I was involved with. And then, um, I'm the principal investigator at Royal Melbourne and have done the implantation of the first in human study. Uh, with my colleague, uh, Andrew Morikoff's a neurosurgeon who did the, he's got expertise in the, um, the telemetry device. So he, he would connect the lead into the telemetry device, which was placed in a, uh, infra, infraclavicular, uh, pocket, but I'd do the, uh, implantation in the superior sagittal sinus. That's been really exciting work. Um, yeah. you know, from to, to make it work, you know, we had to figure out ways to, we do functional imaging to make sure that the patient had um, motor cortex in close proximity to a normal caliber superior sagittal sinus. The access had to be good. We had to have redundancy in the transverse sinuses being of similar caliber. Um, then we had to superimpose the fMRI identified motor cortex on the angiographic image to make sure that this relatively short stent electrode was placed symmetrically over the motor cortex. And that was um, an on-table practical challenge, which we, 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 uh, we succeeded in and we have in all four of the patients who were uh, implanted uh, had the device in the right place and have been able to get a signal um, and then they've all been able to learn how to uh, in, in a simple way they, they, they think a certain thought um, and that might be moving their thigh or moving their left big foot bit big toe and that generates a signal and then they can learn to change that thought to change that signal which is then um, uh, decoded by the computer to allow, at this stage, just communication. So it's allowing them to interface with a, a computer so they can move a mouse type words. Um, and that's been, yeah, that, that has been very exciting. The, yeah. We've got um, approval to just start the second phase trial in Australia. So instead of five patients, which we were going to do in the first trial, we'll do 15. Uh, there's uh, hopefully going to be a trial in the US as well. Uh, wow. So I, look, I think we're still we're still looking at years away, um, but I, I, uh, it seems a very attractive and very innovative and interesting uh, project. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And then they, uh, I'm guessing they take the dual antiplatelets or they don't need to for a little while until we've, it realizes and integrates. Yeah, we've, we've had them anticoagulated for the procedure only, then anticoagulation is allowed to wear off. They remain on dual antiplatelets for um, three months, I think it is. And then we've stopped 
uh, the Plavix and they remain on aspirin. So right. yeah, and, and so far, one of the safety, the last subject hasn't reached his 12 month safety evaluation yet, which is when we, we do regular MR and CT to look for um, thrombosis or occlusion um, and touch wood. So far, uh, none of the subjects have, have had any uh, delayed sinus thrombosis, which was probably our biggest fear, um, leaving a lead because the lead runs, um, you know, through the superior sagittal sinus out through the transverse. Um, you know, there are certainly some, you know, the, the device will be improved. Um, it's, it's not an easy device to deliver through the sigmoid sinus and transverse sinus uh, with the size system we have to use, it's technically quite, quite challenging, mm -hmm. um, and that's continually improving as the, the you know the, the stiffness of the lead and all those sort of things uh, continue to improve. But yeah, as I say, all you know the of the four subjects we've attempted, we've succeeded in all four. Amazing, I've been following the project for about ten years, and um, I asked. Dr. Oxley and at Svin, I think it was 2016, how, how he is creating this company and doing his fellowship at the same time. And basically he said he doesn't have a girlfriend and he doesn't sleep. So I hope it's easier now, but it obviously took a considerable amount of effort to, you know, make this dream a reality. It's, it's, it's novel. Yeah, look, absolutely. The, the, you know, to come up with the concept. Um, and then to work through uh, in an animal lab situation after having developed uh, the device. Um, and then, as you say, starting off with an Australian based uh, company um, in partnership with Royal Melbourne and the University of Melbourne, then to take it to um, a, a US based company, which to take it that next step and get FDA approval for yeah. the trial, all of those sort of things while you're completing uh, a neurointerventional fellowship uh, is uh, is hats off to the fact that he doesn't sleep and doesn't have a girlfriend. I didn't know the no girlfriend bit. Yeah, well, yeah, I I told him thank you for your sacrifice. And I have a lot of <laughs> so, right, in the last thirty years, we are not perfect in our management of ischemic strokes, but we've made great strides. Uh, in hemorrhagic strokes, though, do you think the time has come? Or are we we're making some strides, right? We see the the end of the beginning of the tunnel, or how would you call it? Um, I, I'll, with hemorrhagic stroke, you're referring to aneurysmal bleed, or you're referring to intraparenchymal hemorrhage? I'm referring to intraparenchymal hemorrhage with the MISTI yeah. trials and the devices to evacuate, but they're not quite positive, and it might be device dependent or procedure dependent. But uh, I, I think we're getting there. Yeah, look, I think the devices. Uh, the, the surgical evacuation approaches and the move to minimally invasive or less invasive surgical approaches <coughs> um, offer offer a lot of, of promise. I mean, we've been involved with um, uh, Stop Ost and, and various other um, pharmacological trials. So many of them have, with transoxemic acid and there's various other agents, so many of them have have come up as neutral trials when they get to large populations. And, and we tried to enrich the population by looking for the spot sign and try to identify people on imaging who are more likely to deteriorate and therefore may be more likely to benefit from interventions. And really it gets back to what we did with our extend IA trial. You know, all of the trials that had been done to up to that date, other than a couple of exceptions, had been negative or neutral. And it was almost the last ditch for mechanical treatment of stroke. If we didn't prove it, it wasn't going to get funded. And already large groups of the stroke community were moving away from endovascular treatment. So we 
found a group of patients in Extend IA with perfusion imaging who were most likely to benefit from a large vessel reopening strategy. And that hadn't been done much before um, in terms of the neutral trials. And in parallel with that, play all around the world, the other trials did the same thing, really. You, you tried to make sure you were treating the patients who were likely to benefit or most likely to benefit. And when you had a tight population and a better procedure, we were, we've showed that it unequivocally works. I think the same thing with intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Um, if you, to, to get numbers into a trial, you want to throw the net as broadly as you can because you need numbers. But if you take in everybody with an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, um, the chance that you've got a population that is going to benefit is pretty small. And so I, 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 and I don't work primarily in hemorrhagic stroke myself now, but I think identifying that group who are going to do badly, who are going to have hemorrhage growth and who are going to um, benefit from the intervention. I think that's the key. Otherwise, you're going to be doing the same thing again. It'll, any benefit will be lost um, in the great numbers of people who have no possibility of benefiting. Which is why, can you imagine if we'd done any of the pivotal stroke trials and included everybody from those with a 10 mil core to those with a 200 mil core and you threw them all into the mix and you treated them all, the chance of that trial being positive would be almost zero. Yeah. The numbers you'd need to have to be powered to show a difference would be extraordinary and we wouldn't have got anywhere. Yeah, 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 very well put. Thank you. So um, you are a very enthusiastic teacher of radiology and an avid participant in Radiopedia I have seen. Oh, yeah. um, for those who are just starting their careers in, in stroke, um, what inspires you to teach and how do you include it in your busy schedule? That's an interesting question. Um, uh, look, I've, I've been, I think we all make a, a decision as to whether you're going to go into an academic practice or a non-academic practice. Um, and I think an academic practice is also a teaching as well as a research-based practice. Um, so I made that decision that I, I liked. I, I changed from surgery. I started off as a surgical trainee and training in uh, surgery. And back in the late 80s, um, I thought minimally invasive uh, was the way to go across multiple areas of surgery. Um, and to do that, you had to go into academic and had to, you know, had to go down that pathway. So I've been lucky to be at the right place at the right time for that. Um, and then when you go into teaching, I feel like I, I think you get as much, the teacher gets as much out of it as the as the fellow. I mean, it, it, it keeps you interested, keeps you hopefully open to new things rather than subject to hubris. Um, and makes us uh, try try new things. And I've also been, uh, you've mentioned Radiopedia. And, and so Frank Gaylard, who um, Radiopedia was the way he was accumulating information in his study to be a consultant radiologist. It was the way he learned. Um, and he was a trainee in our department. I was lucky enough that he worked with us as a radiology registrar for five years and then as a fellow doing neuro radiology and then as a senior consultant and valued colleague so um you know i i'm proud of the fact that i was involved in teaching frank um but then uh, for the next 10 or 15 years i've been learning from frank so it's a uh, yeah, it's it's just a, a wonderful way to do things, and I I just like I like being surrounded by people who have who are learning and have asked questions and and do things. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Um, thank you for that.
Um, sure. You've had a very successful and influential career so far. Do you have any advice for us who are starting out um, when it comes to having a busy and successful career, but also balancing your mental health, family, and other interests? Do you you have a do you have a balance? Do you have any tricks, or you just go <laughs> go all in? <laughs> no. Um, oh, Leah, you don't want to you don't want to look too much back on regrets. Um, I, I've been very fortunate that my wife um, supported me enormously in doing this, um, and uh, I think having an open mind and seeking out challenges. Uh, and opportunities is really important. I suspect that left to my own devices, I may not have gone over to the States to do a fellowship um, because I was offered a position um, at an awful lot more money than you get as a fellow over in the States. Um, but um, it was very much my wife who was saying, look, this is an opportunity. Um, and I, I so grateful I did it. Uh, I started off my neuro intervention there with Stan Barnwell um, up at OHSU and did a diagnostic neuro fellowship and a part time interventional neuro fellowship because that's all that was available back then. Um, and I think if I hadn't have done that, um, I probably wouldn't have continued into neuro intervention. It was just, it was, hap I happened to be there when Stan Barnwell had just moved up from UCLA. Uh, where he'd worked with Grant Ashima um, and this newfangled thing called the GDC. Um, and he'd only just started to do cases at, uh, at Oregon. So it was really being in the right place at the right time. And, and, and it just piqued my interest. Um, and then I was lucky enough, the place I went back to as a neurointerventional uh, person was the, the head of unit was a very senior neurointerventionist in Australia. Um, and it just sort of took off from there. So uh, I, I think be open to opportunity and, and don't be afraid to, to take some risks and travel. And mind you, you don't have to tell anybody in the States that because um, you, you guys, you know, you'll start off in one, you'll do high school in one area, college in another, university in another, flip over to this. Yeah. To the to Europe to do twelve months, come back and do another fellowship. Whereas um, the, the tendency in Australia is much has had been very much that you you did school in your own state, university in your own state, and med school in your own state. Uh, and I think getting out and moving is a is a wonderful thing. That's uh, that's great advice. Well, um, thank you, thank you very much for your time and uh, your honest answers and your advice for us. Um, and uh, we'll keep in touch and fo keep following you. And yeah, thank you. Excellent. Nice to speak to you. All the best. Nice to meet you too.